Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. And today we continue the fascinating story of Kunqi Opera. In the late Qing Dynasty, after 500 years of development, Kunqi Opera faced the greatest crisis in its existence. In Beijing and the regions south of the Yangtze, Kunqi troops disbanded one after another. But even then, Kunqi clung on to its popularity among the people who were traditionally its most fervent fans, the well-educated. So when Kunqi opera was at its lowest ebb, Cai Yuanpei, Wu Mei, and some other great educators and masters of Chinese literature brought it to Peking University. At the same time, a Kunqi workshop was set up in Suzhou. But would Kunqi's future be brighter as a result of all the efforts being made? Up to the time of the May 4th movement in 1919, the new culture flooded China in a variety of forms. In Shanghai, movies and gramophone records had become popular among city people, and for Pathé Phono Cinema China, business was booming. The opera stage was working hard to keep up with the quickly changing cultural environment in order to gain a foothold in this new cultural movement. Peking opera master Mei Lanfang began staging modern productions, or at least new versions of classical works. The temptation to make commercial profits was too great for anyone to resist. With his new approach, Mei Lanfang was making at least 20,000 silver dollars for a month of performances, at a time when a typical white-collar worker was making just 100. But while this overwhelming tide of commercially oriented entertainment was sweeping Shanghai, not far away in Suzhou, tradition had shut itself away inside a garden and it was being passed orally from one generation to the next. The efforts paid off. Three years later when the children completed their studies, each of them had learnt more than 100 dramas by heart. And when the young performers received stage names for performing tours in 1925, each name included the character Chuan, meaning to carry on. In their stage names, the character following Chuan had one of four radicals, Jade, Grass, Gold or Water. Jade was for those who would play male roles. Grass was for those who would play female roles. Gold was for those who would play roles with painted faces. This suggested that their singing would sound like booming bells. The final character, Water, was for the rest of the roles, including clowns signifying a glib tongue. As the most important group of Kuinchu performers in modern history, these young people made their debut on stage.传字辈最重要的意义不在于他们那个时代他们演出传字辈最重要的意义是在于他们的身上传递下来的口传心授的这个传承换句话说我们讲的非物质文化传承或者是非食物没有一个东西在那里的这个传承它必须是口传心授的
，人类历史上，在中国文化跟艺术、舞台艺术历史上最重要的就是这五六十个小孩，他就把这个东西传承下来，带在他身上。From the outset, Mu Ouzhou had planned to retain these children in his factories after they graduated from the workshop. His hope was that they would work in his factories to support themselves between performances that would promote and preserve Kuen Chu. But by 1927, he was seriously disillusioned. Combined, the social turbulence and financial crises of the time proved too much for his factories to bear, and one after another, they were closed. He was no longer capable of supporting his beloved Kuen Chu workshop, and once again, it was in financial crisis. This photo, taken in 1928, shows the young performers ready to set off on an heroic quest to save the day for Kuen Chu. Young and energetic, and fully prepared with all the skills required for their roles, the children were determined. In them had been placed the hope that Kuen Chu would be carried on and eventually be fully resurrected. So, bracing themselves against all difficulties, they set off on a Kuen Chu colonizing mission. <laughs> In Shanghai, they appeared on various stages performing for days in a row under the name The New Tunes Troupe. The troupe became big news in Shanghai. On their debut, celebrities streamed into the theatre, among them Xu Zhimo, Lu Xiaoman, Zhou Xinfang and Gai Jiaotian, all famous literary figures or established opera masters. <laughs> but just as these children were making some headway in their cultural mission, the situation in Shanghai worsened and business for the troop became very slow. Worse still, the members of the troop began to argue among themselves. After what turned out to be a failed mission to revitalize Kuen Chu, in 1931 the troop returned to Suzhou. The New Tunes troupe was disbanded in June of 1931, leaving its members to fend for themselves. 
but some, including Ni Chuan Yu and Zhang Chuan Jian, remained on in Suzhou under the direction of Gu Chuan Lan to continue performing. The young performers who continued with the work were committed. Refusing to yield to fate, within half a year they established another troupe. The new troupe was called Xian Ni, but once again they met with failure. It seemed that intellectual audiences had deserted them. But the greatest destruction was yet to come. In 1937, the performers lost all their costumes and props. It was the Japanese bombardment of Shanghai. The Xian Ni troop was in a dire situation, its members struggling to make a living, ready to take any work they could do. Some joined other troops, while some left behind forever the genre they had studied. Zhao Chuan died in the street one cold snowy night. Xu Chuan Jian died of typhoid during the war of resistance against Japanese aggression. And no one ever found out what became of Chen Chuan Yi, the youngest. The troupe's goal of revitalizing Quenchu opera had proved elusive. It seemed that despite the efforts of members of the educated class to help, nothing could be done to reverse the tide. For a decade, Quenchu opera disappeared completely from the stage. Zhang Chunghe came from a prominent family, her grandfather having been a high-ranking official in the late Qing period, her father a famous educationist in the Republic years that followed. She was one of four daughters, all of whom were to surpass the reputation of their father in circles of the literati. All four of the young women were accomplished in the skills ladies from wealthy families were supposed to possess, chess, playing musical instruments, painting and writing calligraphy and all of them married successful people. Gu Chuanjie, a member of the Chuan generation, linguistic expert Zhou Yoguang, famous writer Shen Tongwen, and Hans H. Franke, the German-American sinologist. Zhang Chunghe's father, Zhang Jiyo, was a close friend of Tai Yuanpei and Wu Mei, both of whom spared no effort in promoting Kun Chu. It was only natural then that all four of Zhang's daughters inherited from their father a love of Kun Chu. Zhang had himself learnt Kun Chu from Shen Chuan Zhu, another member of the Chuan generation. Recording. Hello, <laughs> After she arrived in the US in 1948 together with her husband, Zhang Chunghe lectured on Kuen Chu in 23 American, Canadian, French, Hong Kong and Taiwan universities. She is now 94 years old, yet even after so many years living in the US, her love of Kuen Chu is as strong as ever. Chuan 
While she was still in China before 1948, she performed on stage in Chongqing with a number of members of the Chuan generation. Later, these Kunchu performers lost contact with one another. But in 2002, when Zhang Chonghe returned to China for a visit, she met up with her old friend, Ni Chuan Yu. This is a videotape of Ni Chuan Yu teaching Li Bao Chuan from Taiwan. He was teaching the performer a work entitled Indirect Tongue Lash on Tao Tao. Ni Chuan Yu had learnt the drama many years before in Wu Mu Garden in Suzhou, and the drama had been burned into his mind. After 1957, Ni Chuan Yu taught at the Shanghai Opera School and the school attached to the Jiangsu Kunchu Troupe. Many students benefited from his tutoring. Uh, 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 The Chuan generation felt to revitalize Quanchi Opera. Yet they did perform an important historical mission. They nurtured the art of Quanchi through its most difficult time, just by learning it. It's thanks to them that Quanchi Opera has survived until the present day. Today, all the students and major Quanchi troops nationwide are students of the Chuan generation. And it is with this new generation that high hopes for Kuen Chu continue.
By 1956, New China was seven years old and everyone was busy with socialist construction. But with a new government initiative called A Hundred Flowers to Bloom, Kun Chu was presented with a golden opportunity to rise again. A year before, in 1955, drama performer Yuan Muzhi and writer Ding Ling had met by chance in Hangzhou, and together they had watched a traditional opera performed by the Guofeng Kuen Chu troupe. But although they were delighted by the performance, they had been dismayed to learn that this troupe, the only professional Kuen Chu group still in operation anywhere in the country, was about to disband due to financial problems. The principal performers of the troupe, Zhou Chuan Ying and Wang Chuan Song, were part of Kun Chu's Chuan generation. Yuan Muzhi and Ding Ling immediately approached the authorities in Beijing about the troupe's dire situation. And it was then that the golden opportunity arrived. The troupe was summoned to Beijing to stage a revised version of the classic music drama Fifteen Strings of Cash. <laughs> This is footage from the film of the new version of this old Kunchu opera shot in 1956. <laughs> 里头写着三个官僚，对待这个这一桩冤案的不同态度，这个剧本也压缩了一个晚会就可以演完的。Before the film was shot on April the tenth, nineteen fifty-six, the troupe presented fifteen strings of cash on stage at Beijing's Guanghe Theatre. Thank from Zhejiang to Beijing, from Guanghe Theatre to Zhongnanhai, where the central government was located, Fifteen Strings of Cash won acclaim and gained considerable attention from the party and government leaders. On May the 18th, 1956, the People's Daily published an editorial under the title A Single Drama That Saved an Opera Form from Extinction. This article heralded a new phase in the evolution of Kun Chu. Nineteen fifty six was one of the most important years in all of Quinch's six centuries of history. Following the staging of the musical drama Fifteen Strings of Cash in the capital, Quinch troops were established in Beijing, Jiangsu, Hunan, and Shanghai. There were even amateur groups springing up in Beijing and Shanghai, while in Baoding and Tianjin, Quinch schools were established to train young performers. Quinch seemed to be entering a new golden age. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. Tune in again next time when we'll bring you the last part of our story about the history and development of Quenchu Opera. I'm Qi Xiangjun from CCTV International. See you next time.